And I, I plan to mention the name of Bill Petit just three times. I do bring a question, which, as far as I can tell, is a very pertinent question and not a simple question. Uh, it's what might it be to write in confessedly post-critical ways? What roles, if any, might such writing appropriately play in the academy? Um, and I have developed, as Dale said, but the last years of my teaching, I've been retired almost 10 years, y'all. Uh, but the last several years of my teaching, I developed something that, that is an instance of post-critical writing. It's not the sum of post-critical writing by any means. Uh, but it's something that I've worked with enough simply to think it has some promise. And I called it the Mindings Collage. And for the first nine minutes of our time together this afternoon, I'm going to ask that we get inside it. I'm not interested in it being something more to talk about, uh, but to get within and to see a sample, just a sample, of what that experience is, it can be like. I shamelessly passed these around in the Divinity School Library yesterday morning, but if you didn't get one or don't have one now, please take a copy because we're going to be working from this uh, beginning right now. It is. It is. Yeah. We've got we've got more than enough here. Good. Um, one way that I found useful to kind of help people begin the mindings collage is by way of commonplaces. I think that's an instructive term. Think about it. Common places. We've heard a fair amount these two days about places as distinct from spaces. The term common places is a commonplace term from the rhetorical tradition. There were times when people kept commonplace books, and a commonplace book was simply a compilation of things that I read or heard that somehow spoke to me that I wanted to keep track of. And so I wrote them in my commonplace book. The last three pages of this handout consist of selections from Sam's commonplaces. Uh, and so I, what I want to ask, and we'll take nine minutes at this, is for you to turn to page 10 and then read, begin reading, or browsing. You don't have to read from first to the bottom. Uh, begin browsing there and, and in the next couple of pages until you find uh, this passage, that is to say one of Sam's commonplaces, something I've gotten from somewhere else that seems to be speaking to you. And when you do find that, pause. And jot down what you hear it saying or what you find yourself thinking in response to it. Okay? Now, so let's do that. And in a couple of minutes, I'm probably going to give you another instruction, kind of sotto voce. Jot down what you hear it say or what you find yourself thinking. Do it now.
it's quite likely that something else has come to your mind. It might be a question that you find yourself having. It might be something from your past that you find yourself remembering. It might be something in the future that you might like to do. Perhaps a book that you'd like to read or reread. An author you've heard of that you're thinking this would be pertinent. A person that you would like to talk with. Well, jot that down. Yeah. Whatever it is. I found when I was writing, composing this, these pages that you've got a question that you had not been aware of having. So jot it down. You might find that something is surprising you that you wouldn't have thought of or wouldn't have thought of as surprising. If so, jot it down. It will take just another one minute. Now, <clears throat> I want to ask that we take three minutes where you turn to a person nearby and reflect on the places you've just been in the last nine minutes. I have no idea what those places are, where those places are. But what, to say it differently, what have you noticed? as you've been working, writing through the last nine minutes. Can we take just three minutes on that? We're, we're, we're going to have one, uh, just one, in, one, one we'll have two. Just have a couple three. of people. Okay, one, one group will have three or something. Yeah. Yeah. Let's move on. Yeah. <laughs> She keeps wanting me to get out here and they let me have it. So, where are the same boats? Yes. What do you want me to do? What do you, what do you just know? I know the stairs. 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 I Right class for I got there was a little boy on the first day of school who said, um, I was sitting on the kids' summer showing them how to walk over because I was going to read on the paper. And he's sitting right here because I knew I needed to get some fun. 
So that's what yeah, contact <laughs> in his <laughs> bank before I had to tell him no, he couldn't do it. I knew he was supposed to write, so I was trying to invest in it before. And he looks up at me and he said, do you know I don't know how to read? I never had a child that aware. Can you imagine a seven or eight year old child just knowing that they don't know how to read? And I said, he said, do you know I don't know how to read? And I said, yes, I do, because I, you know, I look up what's, what you did last year. Oh, but it's okay, because I can do it. It's second grade is a really good time to learn to read. And that child looked at me and she said, could you do it today? <laughs> and, and then, a couple of weeks later, we're walking in the to lunch, and he looks up at me and he said, Miss Watson, we're going to get to the room in the week, say, Oh my goodness, that's all we've been working on. I've got to make sure he knows that what we're doing is going to make it fit. And he didn't know that I was working on it. He believed I could do it that day, and I didn't make that clear either. But the whole business of helping them recognize when they're doing it. And that's my favorite story from second grade. This is so startling. Where did you go? I don't remember. I was So I stayed with the right. Can I? I'm, I'm conscious of time. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm conscious of time and of James Van Pelt, who we're going to be on his time in 10 minutes. Uh, and I don't want to do that. So, would, would any any observations that anyone would like to make it available to the whole table? Well, it's very stimulating. It was very stimulating. You know, the quotes immediately led me to other thoughts. Yeah. 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 Johnny was a chemist, but he is no more. That's what he, I said, Johnny was a chemist, but he is no more. Because what he thought was H2O was H2SO4. <laughs> <laughs> Write that down. Brand has got to get that. Okay, okay. You know, one of, uh, one of Bill Petit. Excuse me, what's H2SO4? Bad. So, sulfuric that? acid. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't have to remember what. It's the acid we put in I car batteries. I, I figured it was something like that. <laughs> One of uh, Bill Petit's phrases I have not yet heard mentioned at this conference is one of Bill's phrases that I haven't heard mentioned here is he was always at pains to make the obvious plausible. Okay? To make the obvious plausible. Right. <laughs> you, you, you need to go talk to the preacher, Sam. The question is, the, what is the obvious? <laughs> right. Um, well, here are, here are, here's a short series of obvious things. You the, think we're not going to get to talk about the quotes we picked? No. No. You got yeah, all, I, you I, got Pharrell. You did, you did to me. <laughs> go ahead and take my time and then we'll... Good dinner. <laughs> right. Okay, here's the first one. I take this as obvious. Just because you don't see nothing doesn't mean that nothing's not there. That's not original with me. It's from the glorious apostolic church of Jesus Christ on Pocket Road between Darlington and Florence, South Carolina. 
a sign out front about nine years ago. Just because you don't see nothing doesn't mean that nothing's not there. Isn't there an extra negative in that? Yeah. A superfluous negative? Is that the point? Yeah. Hmm. When I heard that, that uh, whichever deconstruction is finally deconstructed, I started to send that quote to the English department. I didn't do it. I probably should have. Um, but something else that's obvious. You can't see mind. You cannot see mind. Maybe least of all your own mind. Okay. However, it's like trying to see your shadow, all of your shadow, all at once. Can't be done. Uh, but you can see traces of some of your mind's movements. And it's, it's like the image for it is a cloud chamber where a cloud chamber in nuclear research doesn't capture the particles or the gizmos or whatever. It gives you traces of where they were, right? Mm -hmm. So you can capture traces of where your mind has been. And I think that the mind exists anyway in activity, not in passivity. Uh, so, um, another obvious point. When any of us is engaged in a project of interest to us, and I invite you to think about that word, interest, inter-est, to be between, to place oneself between. When any of us is engaged in a project of interest, we bring something of our past. We orient ourselves toward some potential future. We take note of avenues that we might explore. We talk convivially with friends, including colleagues who have similar interest. We register surprises and we enact, uh, we become increasingly aware of questions that are guiding us. I often think that a perception is the result of some question I'm bringing. I'm probably not aware of the question. I mean, I used to be very aware of that back in the dating gate days, but that was a long time ago. Um, and we enact our thinking in the medium of time. Okay? Sound familiar? It does to me from what I've been reading in Polonian meditations and in especially recovering the ground and philosophical day book. Also, we all know this, that sustained mental activity is a matter of exercising the mind. It's a matter of exercise. It's a matter of discipline. Okay? So I take those to be obvious points. Here's my last obvious point. None of what we have been doing and what I have been saying has much relation to critical thinking, which is what the academy 
typically implies and teaches thinking to be. But not only the academy. It's not only the well. academy. <laughs> That's right. Now, um, so the, uh, the, the, my first intent in the Mindings Collage, which for the last several years of my teaching, I had students keep. They had to do it every day, 15 minutes of concerted, concentrated time, every day, seven days a week. Um, my first intent was to encourage each student to develop some appreciation and some understanding of his or her own distinctive mind at work. And as far as I can tell, that is something which the academy assiduously avoids. Now, the, the last thing today uh, is I'm going to take seven or eight pages of that and pass it on, please. Um, this, I don't know what I'm giving you. But it is from a, a class that I taught, a summer school class, just a five-week class, where the students kept a um, conversation going on the computer about their experiences with their own mindings collages. And so I want to invite you to browse excuse me, Mike, uh, to browse quickly through that and take note of anything that you find notable. I, I really don't need those, uh, those sheets back. Now, I'm a minute over time. Um, the... the James, this is a question mainly for you. You want to go directly into your work or spend a little bit of time here talking or first or what? It's up to you. Why don't we talk a little bit first? About okay. Okay. So, floor is open. Anything you, you notice? I wanted to just say that on interest, uh, I get three different uh, inter between, inter among, yeah. and inter. In your midst, in the midst, yes. in the midst of. Yeah. What's the difference in the last two? Among and in the midst. Um, it's the difference between the kingdom of heaven is among you, and the kingdom of heaven is in your midst. Or within you. Hmm. Within you is out. No, within you is in you. Yeah, yeah. Bad <laughs> translation. <laughs> <laughs> You want to <laughs> I, I don't often cure, accuse myself of brilliance, um, but when I was really did in working toward this, I was thinking through a lot of things anew, and one of them was that provocative contrast on the third page of the handout, and I'm on to something where I'm saying that post-critical writing, I put myself in the midst of subjects. Whereas critical, the critical orientation is to write about a subject. Notice that word about. That's from somewhere else. From external. Or to create an external. Yeah. Yeah. So. I you something Poteet wrote. Please. It's the... Uh, it's not that he sent to me, it's a book proposal. You and gonna read the whole thing or just part of it? No, just part, this is part of it. Okay. <laughs> my man. I, I won't read any of it if you don't read it. No, you go ahead. Okay, and, uh, I, I've uh, looked around, and nobody else has seen this thing but me. I think I gave a copy to Wally and I am. You know what, okay. And I think it's the it's the book proposal for <coughs> recovering the ground. Yes, I think. Okay, the usually hidden premise of this book is that Western culture derived its inner invention 
and defined its character in the making of a tragic choice. Mm -hmm. Not recognized as such when made, banished from our memory ever since. I mean the embrace of the power, parenthesis, and because of its power, close parenthesis, of the written word to displace what was then taken by contrast to be the inconstant, henceforth inferior reality of the world embodied in mere oral, oral life. What we gained was the power of God. What we lost was our incarnate human existence as speaking and hearing persons in the midst of our duties and times. Yeah. Yeah. Me, he wrote that, I mean, <laughs> which I think is the... <laughs> the, the <laughs> let, let me just comment very briefly, not on yeah. that. Um, but the, it's remarkable to me in, in putting together this thing. I give, I give you an annotated bibliography of some major movements in the, over about a 20 year period. How the teaching of writing has come to be dominant, the dominant metaphor in the teaching of writing is voice now. It's voice. Uh, and the people who teach speech, they're doing diagrams. They have, ta and I would love to know how we got to take over each other's metaphors, but we really did. <laughs> and, and let me say too, that the people I cite here, with the exception of Louise Phelps, are philosophically naive. All but a couple of them mention Polanyi in footnotes, but they, they are not philosophers. Louise is. So. Now, having said that, my wife teaches writing, right? We share it with her. Yeah. And she teaches it from the oral tradition, mm -hmm. not from the written tradition. I don't know. So, so Poteet is not right here, you think? You think he's headed in the wrong direction? I don't think so. Well, you want to speak to that, but I'd, I'd like to. Keep focused if we can on, oh. on Sam. I, I, I was trying to focus on him. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, it, we can spend a lot of time unpacking Botita at this point. I, I, will, I will now read you what I started to begin this session by reading. Can I just ask one quick question before you mm -hmm. go into the windup? Um, about the commonplace book, I'm thinking about what I get from my young relatives on Facebook uh, huh. and in their blogs. Do you see a connection there? I have no idea. Uh, I, have, I don't do Facebook and things like that, but I, I just don't know. I, I just want to interject something in relation to, the, to, to, to what you've taken us through. Yeah. Uh, what you have had your students go through and what we went through in connection with this, it seems to me two, two important things relating to uh, teaching in a post-critical way, okay? Hmm. One is that through, uh, and it partly it's crystallized by the quote from Stafford on the first page for me, uh, where, where it's, it relates very much to the whole idea that, that the, well this is a paraphrase of it, that that the writer discovers through writing, oh, yeah. okay? uh, and, and uh, that in, in effect what you allow your students to do, sort of occasion your students, is students listening to their own voice as written. Uh, in, in that sense, it, it, there is something of the temporality of the oral oral, oral, oral in this writing process. That's cool. Okay, and, uh, and, and then just creating or taking or imposing even uh, a space uh, outside of or bro breaking out of the usual uh, captivity to the traditional educational model that, it, that in effect it creates. And, and I, I really think that may be a crucial element of any genuine uh, post-critical experience in education. Can I ask a question from that 
I think you said that the process of writing involves making use of the temporal dimension or yeah. awareness. This the process he has has his students go through. Yes. On the other hand, Pope tells us that it's the oral dimension that brings out the temporal, not reading. I, I agree with that, I, and I'm saying it's by a kind of analogical extension. Okay. But there's something of the oral oral by analogy okay. in this experience. I see that. Yeah. But okay. Petit always in his writing assumes that writing is one thing and that it is conceptual. In its body and force. And that it is abstract. And the answer is, that's not true. Uh, it is more or less conceptual, abstract, etc. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the ways in which Jimmy Britton is important when he is founding his theory of how people learn to write in the expressive mode. Language close to the self mm -hmm. is, his, is his, uh, mm -hmm. his definition of that. Mm -hmm. Now, I, Dale knows this, but I have brought a question to you. And the question is, how would Petit have his students write? How would Petit have his students write? And so here's... That's a good question. Yeah, it's partly that, but I, yeah. I, I was, you know, when I have a moment, I just want to say hmm. one of the things Petit did in the same relates to this. You know what? One of the things Petit had his graduate students do relates to this. Okay. Now, let, let me read, I don't maybe some of y'all wrote this, but let me read from the Petit website the section on his teaching. I have every reason to believe it's accurate. Petit's primary aim in teaching was to provoke and assist his students to undergo a paradigm shift in sensibility, a shift from the ordinary mode of critical intellection and reflection that characterizes modernity and predominates in the academy to a post-critical mode of thinking. First of all, this involves a shift from attending solely to the what a content, a teaching, a matter to be subjected to intellectual mastery and critique as an indifferent object of thought, to becoming aware of and keeping track of the how of intellection itself. Something predominantly tacit, but profoundly consequential. Specifically to the how of one's responsive relationship as person in the world to it, to how one happens to be relating oneself to it." End quote. As I say, I have every reason to think that is absolutely accurate characterization of Petit's pedagogical intent. But here is what Petit says. As if an anticipatory rejoinder. Recovering and revaluing these antecedent data upon which our reflection a critically relies in the setting of the regnant modern picture is a well nigh impossible task. He continues in a footnote to that passage. That's Bologna Meditations, page 37. The footnote reads, so resistant to correction is this misleading picture that I have had graduate students who had long since grasped at the explicit level the import of it for our account of our knowings, but who nevertheless fell again under its bondage in the midst of philosophical practice. Or in uh, Blinding Meditations, page 203, 30 years of trying to make this obvious point so that it could be interiorized by students, persuades me that it must be said, our lively mind bodies are the omnipresent, radically inalienable, 
and logically necessary matrix within which all our meanings, acts of meaning discernment are conceived and brought to term. No matter how abstracted from this matrix are the vectors by which these are, acts are born. The vectorial arc of radical meaning moves like music through our mind bodily integrity. End of quote. Thank you. Quick addition to that. Um, in April, I went to the biennial conference toward a science of consciousness mm -hmm. at the University of Arizona. And I spoke there. Um, but the kind of the leader in one branch of that field of study, who is an anesthetologist, uh, had abandoned the, the uh, metaphor of the computer for information processing mm -hmm. and had decided that the proper uh, metaphor of how the mind works is music. Is what? Music. music. Symphony. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Y'all, thank you. If, if you want to look at what a student's mining collage looks like, the, without names, I should get them back, but here's a half dozen, so that where the students at the end of the term had kept their mining collage on a disc and gave it to me and with permission to use it. I so, have one more question if I can ask it. You have to tell me if I can ask it because I ain't going to ask it and you tell me I can You can ask it. it. We may not have time for answering. What about the notion of story? In the involved in this uh, this uh, kind of voice. Yeah, yeah. The people who that was a good question. Great question. <laughs> Absolutely. Great. The the people who take voice more seriously <laughs> tend to center on understandings of story. And I want to uh, on the importance of of narrative. Um, <clears throat> I have this hesitation about it, that it can simply end, end in nice stories and never lead anywhere beyond that. Uh, or as I put it in the, the, the provocative contract, um, where the hell that is, uh, that it can be absorption with oneself. And I think maybe that's also alienation from oneself. I mean, as a writing teacher, I've read lots of papers about grandma. And I and and they were they were of varying quality. Uh, and I think it may be very well be that all of them were useful for the writer to write. I really don't question that. But I would like for the writing to go someplace other than just the narrative of one's own story. Mm -hmm. Though it's grounded in that. Mm -hmm. So the I'm sorry, but the in the ghetto, black children come from story. That's right. More than they come from this other stuff. Absolutely. And one of the, my wife, who teaches it, experienced so much, so much power in not just in the story, but in the capacity to write. They were, they were, in, they were moved by the story to do the writing. Amen. Not writing from somebody else's writing. And I could see, I could, I could see that this, uh, uh, you know, uh, was a great, Touchstone. I don't know if that you know, it feels like it is. It is. Yeah. So I, I don't think he's saying back to you. I think he he's not in conflict or disagreement. Oh no, I I, I feel no. sympathetic. Great. Yeah. <laughs> I think now is a good point.